Hi, Beth. Uh, it's an extraordinary pleasure to be here, and I have to say just a little bit intimidating. There are people in this audience whose work I have followed and admired for many years. There are students whose work I hope to follow going forward, and then there are people who just scare the shit out of me, so it's always nice to be here. <laughs> Where is Keith? Keith goes, bingo. I was astonished two days ago to discover that Kai has been going on for 29 years, and yet you haven't turned a plenary session into either a drinking game or bingo. Um, as an Australian, I find both of those things deeply remiss. And Keith and I and several other people have gone about solving this. So at some point, if Keith starts screaming bingo very loudly, you'll know I've done something truly dreadful. What I wanted to do here, however, was take Beth's invitation to think about the future of Kai and think about it from a very sort of what I hope is a different perspective. I realize that the role of being a plenary speaker is really twofold, maybe threefold. One is to keep you all awake while you nurse your respective hangovers and jet lag. I recognize the second is to be a little bit provocative, and those of you who know me well know that that's almost inevitable. And I think the third thing is to try and ask some hard questions and maybe set some stakes in the ground about the things we might want to talk about and might want to think about. I titled this talk more than two months ago, but I realized looking at it last night that I had to acknowledge Lee Starr and her passing and say that while I didn't know her well, her work was incredibly influential to me and I know to many other people in the room, and it is a great loss to our community and to our scholarship that she can't be with us. So I wanted to sort of say you can't think about mess and messiness without thinking about Lee. I also couldn't begin this talk without acknowledging that there are other threads running through this conference that impact me and some other people in this room. Uh, Beth got to gazump me by starting with a photo of me as a child. This is actually my current favorite photo of me as a child. My mother is an anthropologist. I grew up on her field sites in Central Australia, and much to my horror, she has decided now is a good time to start scanning all of her photos. <laughs> and they're terrifying. This, however, is my favorite. I would be the one in the middle. It turns out while I'm very good at many things, killing lizards is only one of them. Um, I don't know why my brother has the bigger lizard, but it should be said he's now in the SAS. That would be the Special Forces in the Australian Army, so this might have been a good indicator of what was to come. It is the case that I grew up in and around anthropologists. I've been in anthropology departments since I was five years old. I was kicked out of my first anthropology seminar at six when it turned out I could work out what matrilateral cross-cousin marriage was and no one else could. Um, turned out I could just follow the purple dots. Uh, matrilateral cross-cousin marriage became a different concept when I actually worked out what it was that I had assented to as I was being sent out into the corridor. It also means that the notion of thinking about culture and cultural practice and notions of difference is something that I wouldn't say I come by naturally, but it's very hard for me to get away from. I was at dinner last night at the awards, and someone said to me, you're being an anthropologist right now, and I realized I don't know how to turn it off. So what you will hear for the next 45 minutes is me unable to turn that off as I think about the questions of our future. And I also wanted to think here about what it means to be an anthropologist in industry, what it means to be an anthropologist in and around the Kai community. I'm not sure I'm in it, but I'm certainly peripheral to it and thinking about what it is that ethnography and anthropology lets you do in terms of opening up conversations, in terms of asking hard questions. And I know for some people in the room, there is a sense that it might be dangerous. And of course, if you are a lizard, it is. This is my cube at Intel. I recently showed this photo at an Intel forum and was taken aside afterwards by the head of safety for my building who explained to me that I could never use this photo inside Intel again because there were 17 safety violations visible in this image, and I was setting a very bad tone. And I thought to myself, I've been setting a very bad tone for 12 years, you've just noticed. And in order to prevent the person who will inevitably write on the card the question that says, how did you end up at Intel? The answer is very simple, and it's very Australian. I met a man in a bar in Palo Alto in 1998. He asked me what anthropology was. I'd had a beer, so I told him. I then thought, hmm, my mother told me not to talk to strange men in bars, and while I don't follow a lot of my mother's advice, this seemed like a good piece of advice to follow, and I stopped talking to him. The next morning, he called me at my house in Palo Alto, which is interesting because this was 1997, before Google, before really all of one's personal information was available online, and he'd called every anthropology department in the Bay Area looking for a red-headed Australian, <laughs> and Stanford gave me up, hook, line, and sinker. Here's her name and her home phone number. <laughs> I thought, you know, here's the rule. Your mother may tell you not to hang out with strange men in bars, but they're going to find you anyway. <laughs> if they're committed, you've got no hope. So he says, you know, I want to offer you a job. I have a job. 
one thing led to another, and I had an interview at Intel. Uh, it was an interesting moment. Intel had just discovered behavioral interviewing, which they understood to mean stress the candidate and see what happened. <laughs> so for a day, they yelled at me, and me being a good Australian girl yelled right back. And at the end of the day, they said, you're hired. And I said, you people are all crazy. <laughs> and I'm leaving. And it took them eight months to convince me to come back. Uh, and part of what was the attraction, I have to say, as someone who'd been an academic anthropologist, my background was in Native American ethno history. You want to know about indigenous people and indigenous rights? I was your girl, not so much anymore. And I couldn't work out what I'd do there. And for six months, that held me back. And then one day, I had a really kind of quintessential moment of waking up and realizing that if I stayed in the academy, I knew what the next seven years of my life would look like. I knew every journal I had to publish in. I knew where my book had to come out. I knew what courses I needed to teach. I knew what committees I needed to belong to. And I remember thinking, oh god, that's seven years planned out quarter by quarter. And here's Intel, who can't actually tell me what I'll be doing day two. Because day one is compulsory training. But day two was up in the air. So I go, I, I must immediately join Intel. And so I call them back. I start. I go through the compulsory training. On day two, my boss sits me down and says, right, good news, you're going to be responsible for two things. I think, yeah. Clarity. So I get up my pen and paper, because I'm old-fashioned. She says, number one, <laughs> you will be responsible for installing the Shield management update. Thank you. Number one, she says, you will be responsible for women. <laughs> exactly. And I say, as the good anthropologist, which women? <laughs> she says, all women. And I go, all 3.2 billion? She's like, yes. And so I write down, women, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And then I realize there's a second thing. <laughs> and as Tom pointed out last night, the answer was not men. No, because that would have been easy. It's like, what's, what's the other thing, Chris? She says, R-O-W. And I write it down and then realize I have no idea what it means. What would that be then? She says, that would be rest of world. And I very gingerly say, what's world in this context? <laughs> it's like, that's America. So I write R-O-W in parentheses, not America, exclamation mark. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm set. I have a job for life. I have women and everyone else. And Intel has me. And I think there are days when they probably wondered. Because truthfully, it has to be said, at the very end of my interview, they said to me, is there anything else we need to know about you? And I said, well, mm, kind of a feminist. And sometimes I have unreconstructed Marxist tendencies. <laughs> and one of them said, will we like that? <laughs> and I had to very honestly say, not for at least the first six months. So. I often will summarize that early period of my life as Intel's moment of irrational exuberance, right? If you think this was 1998, this was the dot-com era, this was as close as Intel got to really kind of taking a plunge. And every now and again, I think we've won. I've spent 12 years at Intel talking to Intel about people and why people are important and doing field work all over the world. I have an amazing team who work with me. We get to do great research. It's been a wonderful time to be at Intel and to talk about what it means to have people in the story of technology, innovation, and invention. And I think I'm winning. And then they show me this. And I think to myself, first, who knew that George Bush Sr. was working for an advertising agency? <laughs> you know, life after the presidency is a strange and wonderful thing. And then those of us who spend time in people's houses start to wonder the next set of questions. Other than Canadians, where can you find three generations of people cohabitating so happily? <laughs> And I say this is part of the British Commonwealth. We love Canadians. Go Canada, go curling. It's all good. Other than curling, what possible content is there that three generations of a household are going to watch with such unmitigated pleasure? <laughs> Who has small children and white furniture? <laughs> Who has a television set, and you can see the edge of it there, with no clutter? And as a very bright bunny at my office pointed out to me recently, since when does the wife get the remote control? <laughs> so I look at this and I thought to myself, oh, you discovered people, but you discovered the wrong ones. <laughs>
And so this photo put up and I put up this one. <laughs> because when I think about what it means to talk about people and to talk about daily life and to talk about what it means to be in someone's home, I know that it means talking about all these things. It means talking about the places where we know people live, the conditions of those houses. We know it's about mess and clutter. In this case, it's about seven remote controls. We know it's about devices that compete for our attention. It's about televisions, it's about VCRs, it's about legacy equipment. This man has two VCR players as well as his DVD player as well as a cable box. He also has an automatic foot massage machine and a fax machine and an air conditioner, all competing for the same limited amount of electricity. And we think about what it means to design technology, systems, services, applications for people's lives now and in the future we're not designing for pristine, white, clean, uncluttered furniture. We're designing for this. And wrapping our heads around what this means and what this looks like is what I have spent really the last 12 years at Intel doing. And when I think about what it means to talk about an HCI for the future, for me, it's about orienting to this, not to George Bush Senior. So what does all that mean for us, right? And what might the future hold? This has to be by far and away my favorite picture of the future. Um, the Australian government and the American government have both recently been putting forward plans about broadband and they inevitably have lit up fiber cables kind of twined together. This comes from the Korean government and under the title You Are Happy Life, it talks about a ubiquitous society and about the role of technology in it. Now, I have to pause and ask how it is that sulfur crested cockatoos came to be part of South Korea's future. I mean, I would understand what they were doing in an Australian picture. This is a little more complicated. I did, in fact, contact the people who designed these images because I was so curious, and the answer was, they're pretty. <laughs> and I thought, you've never lived in Australia because they're also really loud. What's fascinating about this image, if you read it in a kind of visual studies way, a cultural studies way, even semiotically, is that it has a couple of really interesting things in it. Firstly, it has a book entitled Ubiquitous. So already in this vision of the future is a notion of what you might want to call legacy technology the things that are the stubborn artifacts that we know don't go away, the iPad, and there are more iPads in this room than I think anywhere else in the country at the moment, the iPad notwithstanding, we know there will be legacy artifacts, things that stubbornly, materially just don't disappear in the face of new technologies. So you've got the book called out as both past, present, and future. You have a satellite, and you have these wonderful tree-like alien things in the background which are actually a pre a Korean apartment buildings. And all this is about putting a stake in the ground about what the future of Korea might look like. And as we think about what it means to put a stake in the ground about what many different futures look like, I think we have to imagine that it's not always going to be something that privileges technology. It's not always going to have that in the foreground. And even when it does, it will be competing for space and symbolism with all these other things. And for me, as we start thinking about what the future might hold and the future that materially impacts the work we all do in this room, there are a series of things I think you need to attend to. I think we need to think about demographic shifts, technical shifts, and practice shifts. And I want to just kind of spell out a few of those before I tell you where I think that lands all of us. So there are a series of demographic shifts, I think, that are critically important. And some of you have heard me talk, have heard me belabor these, so I don't want to dwell on them too much. But there are at least four areas where there are things happening that in the next five to 10 years will materially change the landscape in which technology is produced, consumed, and resisted. The first one has to do with the changing nature of the places that we live. At the beginning of the last decade, so in 2000, 50% of the world lived in urban spaces. By the end of this decade, it will be nearly 70%. By 2025, it will be 75%. Talking about three quarters of the world's population living in cities. That has material impact for the kind of work we all do. It has impact for the kind of infrastructures that are generated. One of the things about cities is they turn out not to be a bountiful supply of all infrastructural possibilities. Uh, Beijing and Shanghai over the last couple of years have had to have various kinds of arrangements to limit and ration power. Turns out when you have 18 million people, you can't always get everyone electricity. So if we think about what it means to be in a city, it may not mean abundant electricity, it may not mean abundant water, it may not mean abundant housing or transportation. And in fact, it may mean crises in all of those things. What it means to get electricity to 75% of a population, the world's population now living in cities, what that means in terms of other forms of infrastructure are all interesting challenges. And how those cities talk back to the places where their residents come from, how we think about things like the diaspora, how we think about things like urban migration, 
how we contend with the ways populations will move backwards and forwards. During the global financial crisis, nearly 150 million Chinese citizens moved between cities and, and, cities and rural areas in less than a six-month period. Thinking about what that means in terms of mass migrations of people is astonishing. It also has huge implications for the housing spaces that people live in. Amazingly enough, in 2010, Australia eclipsed the United States in something, and it's not something we should be particularly proud of. In 2010, Australians finally had bigger houses than Americans. Up until then, Americans, for the last really 100 years, have had the biggest houses in the world. The average American house is somewhere between 2,300 to 2,700 square feet. It has, on average, about 2.5 residents. So those of you who aren't American and you think Americans need a lot of space around them, it turns out to be true. They need at least 1,000 square feet each. Big houses, freestanding for the most part, with the exceptions of possibly Chicago, New York, a few other cities. Most Americans are living in large houses with few occupants. As you move to other parts of the world, that really shifts. In Europe, the average household size, if you could calculate it, is probably about 1,000 square feet, and the number of occupants goes up slightly. By the time you get into some of the biggest countries in the world and some of the biggest cities in the world, household sizes have shrunk even further, down to 400 to 800 square feet. And I could do this conversion in meters, but I'm figuring most of you can handle feet in a kind of, you know, empirical sense. Um, so we're talking about smaller houses, we're talking about high density occupation, about two thirds of those houses are shared wall which means they share a wall with other people, and that has huge implications for all sorts of things we care about, one of them being wireless networking. If you've got that many people in that amount of dense space, wireless networks like to go further, and they actually don't know that you've run into someone else's apartment. Housing material will matter. Number of people living in houses is changing. While India and most African nations still have the highest number of residents in a home, somewhere between five to seven, in Western Europe, more than 30% of houses have only one resident, same in the United States. So we're talking about changing notions of who occupies houses and how big those houses are. All of which again has implications for how we think about communication technology, how we think about things like smart electrical meters, smart housing, and who we imagine lives in those places. So we have urbanization, we have diminishing in some places household and family size, we have an aging population, over the next 10 years, that shift becomes more and more significant. By the end of this decade, half of China's population will be baby boomers, half of the United States also. So if we imagine that the kind of gray wave, as it's sometimes called, is a Western phenomena, that's quite inaccurate. We're talking about populations that are aging and shifting where the wealth is. So about 10% of Chinese citizens hold 80% of bank accounts and 80% of the wealth. Uh, we're talking about places where older people are not only still in work, but maybe controlling the spend of their household, even if they're not making all the money in their household. And as we start to imagine a population where half of the world increasingly gets to be, I mean, misnomered as baby boomers, but of a, a particular set of age, that also means that our preoccupation in developing technology for kids may be misplaced. <laughs> and we might want to think about putting as much energy into pop technologies for an entire population rather than just for younger kids, because that's clearly not where it's going. And then last but not least, and you know, this was always the one I like to talk about at Intel, because they never can get their heads around it, is that in all these other shifts that are happening, one of the other things that has happened is that women have joined the workforce. And while that's been a shift that's been going on since the end of World War II, it's one that's accelerated in the last 15 years. If you look at the data that's coming out of the United States during the global financial crisis, it's been really interesting. This is a, a time of economic downturn that has disproportionately impacted male workers, not female workers. And this is a period of time where women in the workforce have actually hit record numbers. It also means that women's historical, certainly post-war in many countries in this world, historical control of the purse strings in most homes and the ability to control discretionary spending under about $1,000 in most households has really interesting impact for how we think about things like marketing messages, who we imagine the targets for technology purchasing are, and what it is we imagine the messages are we should wrap around technology as we sell it. Uh, in some of the field, the phenomena that is lovingly called the shrink it and pink it, phenomena of making technology for women by making it smaller and pink. And I would say shrink it, pink it, and bling it would be the new phenomena, which is if you put crystals on it, apparently we will all just flock forth and buy it. I don't know about you, but so far that hasn't worked for me. 
uh, continues to be a really interesting thing to attend to. So what might it mean if we had women as the kind of unmarked category for our technology production rather than men? It starts to create interesting things. So set of demographic trends that clearly play out over the next five years, 10 years. There's also a set of technical ones. Oh, and I should note, no photo in this deck was photoshopped. So this sign really exists. And as an American said to me recently, who'd spent some time in Australia, is this sign a cautionary sign? <laughs> Caution, internet access in one kilometer. Part of what's wonderful about this sign to me is it suggests that in some places in the world, the internet is still a destination, much like a bathroom that you could use or avoid. It also suggests, however, some other interesting things that are going on and that are trends that seem to be accelerating. The first one is, an, it's nice to go back to the term feral here, uh, the notion of something that was once domestic that has run loose and is now off on its own, doing its own thing. It's so again, a very, I mean, in some ways I think an Australian concept, but one that many of us have heard before. And to think about the internet this way is for me really powerful and it's an interesting theoretical intervention. So if we think about where the internet has been and the devices to which it has been attached, and we think about the last sort of two to three years when the internet has become something that has powered cell phones, has powered e-books, uh, satellite navigation devices, gaming consoles, televisions, medical devices, and it's empowered them in different kinds of ways. Sometimes it's brought a web front end with it. Sometimes it's just brought content. Sometimes it's just taken content away. Sometimes you don't even really know it's the internet. But in all of those places, the internet is also being reconfigured. Think about the iPhone, think about a whole series of other things. To make the internet work there, it needed to be fragmented into little pieces that we think of as apps. <laughs> and that was about managing down something that is otherwise unmanageable. And it's also about mapping the experience of a small mobile device to what it looks like in all these other places. Similarly, you see the internet being reconfigured in other places where the access points are different. So Ethan Zuckerman has some lovely work looking at the use of internet on mobile phones in southern Africa and talks very much about how the internet there has become a list. It's become text-based. It doesn't need to be flash. It doesn't need to be sort of visually attractive because really what it's about is simply getting to information. So if we have the internet moving onto multiple platforms and changing as it goes and also being changed by the platforms it arrives on, we have a dramatic transformation in who it is that's using the internet. I know in the abstract for this talk, I talked about the fact that in the last 10 years, you've had a shift from basically 70% of internet users being American to less than 20%. That means a whole lot of other people have come online who've brought with them different ways of thinking about things, different ideas about knowledge practice, different ideas about what it means to approach and think about information, different ideas about what it means to hoard and store information. I mean, if you think about Wikipedia, it is an encyclopedia, and the encyclopedia was invented well, by Isadora of Sevilla, a good Catholic saint, Tom. In fact, the patron saint of encyclopedias and libraries, and for a while, the patron saint of the internet. And the notion that there's a continuity there about how knowledge is organized thematically is one that makes sense to us, but may not be what it is that the internet looks like going forward. So we clearly have technology not in the wild, but feral. We also have stubborn devices, I like to think of, in changing practices. So one of the fascinating things about my job at Intel over the last five years is really it's been about convincing Intel that the television was not a PC waiting to happen. And that lurking inside every television was not a PC knocking on the screen going, emancipate me, let me out. And then in fact, the thing about televisions was that people kind of loved them, sort of sometimes guiltily, mostly not. And in fact, if you look at the statistics about television use over the last decade, we watch more television now than we did 10 years ago. And that's not because we're watching it on laptops and iPads, for those of you in this room. It's because we're actually still watching more TV. And the group who is watching the most more TV in the last five years are 18 to 24-year-olds. So this notion that television has somehow been eclipsed by the internet turns out to be staggeringly wrong. And in fact, we, in the United States, it's, we watch, what is it, five times more television than we spend time on the internet, on average. None of you in this room, I'm sure, fit that average. <sighs> So sad, so not normal. But were we outside of this room, we were just to poll people on the streets, you would discover it's about a 5x to 1 ratio. Globally, it's about 25x to 1. The only place that has parity between TV viewing and internet usage is Israel. Not Finland, as you might have expected, but Israel. 
What has happened, however, is people are still watching television and still using a whole lot of other things in their worlds, books being one of them, cars being another. When we could telecommute, we still actually insist on going to the office. What's changed is the constellation and the ways in which those things are being used in parallel and how it is that different devices now talk to each other, the kinds of ways we multitask, and the kind of things we do when we are multitasking. So there's been a transformation in how some of those objects exist, but the objects themselves haven't gone away. This comes from what has to be my current favorite website, rateyournetworkdiagram.com. <laughs> like, basically hot or not for the network diagram set. Who knew? Who knew? And this is considered to be a simple home networking diagram. And I looked at this and I thought, if this is simple, every homeowner we know is screwed. Because there is no way you can manage this. And the kind of technology ensembles consumers increasingly have in their lives have this kind of feel to them. Because it turns out the notion of convergence, that we're all going to have just the one device to rule them all, the one device to bring them all and bind them all, didn't happen. And what we got instead was a whole lot of devices. And thinking about how those devices worked, how they were managed, and how they were networked is something that creates considerable anxiety in consumers. And there isn't an obvious person to call when it breaks. Things stop working, and I'm willing to bet most of the people in this room get that call. My mother likes to call me from Australia, and I'm like, Mom, you're using Macs on a satellite. I can't even begin to work out how to troubleshoot this problem. Is it windy outside? Yes, I'm like, call me back when it isn't. <laughs> Most of you don't have it quite that easy, but thinking about how it is that this becomes people's reality and what it means for an entire industry of service to catch up to taking care of it. I mean, at some level, we don't have the plumbers of the digital economy or the panel beaters or the guys that are selling you insurance. And in the few places that I can think of where people have started to develop services to take care of this, they're fascinating. We recently spent some time in Egypt doing research. And one of the things we discovered was that in many middle class homes in Cairo, people had an IT guy, like you had a garden guy and a pool guy and a maid. And he came over once a month and he defragged your hard drive and reinstalled your drivers and you know, got rid of some viruses that you'd collected and did a bit of data management. And people thought that was what you needed to have in order to have computers work. And at some level, they may not be wrong. But thinking about what that means as we imagine an increasing proliferation of devices, of infrastructures, of networks, of things that move in and out of our homes, some of which we control, many of which we don't, creates an incredible complexity through which people have to navigate. And when it breaks, it's not always clear what's broken. Which brings me to the last piece here about Yes, this sign comes from England. And that's really all that needs to be said about it. Um, <laughs> but it is my pointer to the fact that one of the other things that's happened in, in the last five to 10 years, and it's certainly something we have seen a great deal of in the research we've been doing, is that there's been a shift in the things about which people worry. So people have always worried about technology. Uh, Justin Cassell has a lovely kind of talk she gives about the sort of shifting notions of people's concerns about technology. Uh, you can talk about what people worried about when the railway arrived in the United States, or radio, or electricity. And it was things like, the death of the American family will be brought about by the railway. Who knew? Electricity, very bad. Family will no longer all gather in one room because they could be distributed in different rooms. Start to sound familiar? Shopping malls, very bad. They'll kill small town America. It's been a series of kind of rhetorical moments that suggest that technology brings with it badness. In some ways, that rhetoric hasn't changed in a long time. What's interesting is what's been added to it over the last five to 10 years. So those of us who've worked in the tech field for a while know that one of the things that often gets thrown up at you as you start to work through projects is, what about privacy? All encountered that? Yes, we know the privacy question. Work we've done recently suggests that people have new things they are concerned about. It's not that privacy has gone away, but interestingly, there is an assumption on the part of many consumers in many parts of the world that all sorts of people already know lots of things about them. They assume their governments and their service providers know things like their household income and their occupations and their education level. What they worry more about people knowing is what they're really doing. And when you start to play out future scenarios with consumers where you say things like, well, you know, all these devices you have that you're consuming content on, they could start to talk to each other and just automatically propagate Facebook or Twitter with what you're really watching on television. And the look on people's faces is, dear God, that would be terrible. 
You think, okay, you've just said how cumbersome it is to have to work through all these interfaces, what's the disconnect? And the disconnect is for many of us, again, I'm sure no one in this room, but for many people on the planet, we lie actively about what we're really watching on television, or more to the point, if we're really watching television. And there are shows you should be watching, should be watching, and shows you are watching. And there are shows that you are watching and you're not watching them ironically. <laughs> so if secretly you like Dancing with the Stars or America's Biggest Loser and you don't watch it rhetorically or ironically, you may not want your devices to propagate that to the entire planet. Because it turns out one of the things we're all deeply afraid of is that these devices will work out we're not cool. These devices will work out we're every bit as dorky and as daggy as secretly we know we are. And the anxiety here is about reputation. It's about image. It is increasingly also, I suspect, because of those things, about authenticity and about trust. And not trust in the can I trust the service, but can I trust the thing I'm being shown? Is this experience real? Is this image real? Is this story I'm engaging with real? And while there appears to be a great willingness to suspend all manner of notions about it needing to be real, there's also an anxiety about what that means. So if we have this new set of what I would call socio-technical anxieties emerging that not surprisingly map to an expansion of technology and changing demographics, where does all of that leave us? Um, it leaves us with another great sign. I, I still don't know what this means. So I have it here just as a kind of you know, open question as to what a proof and est experimental establishment would be. And I couldn't help but want to ask the questions about what the implications for research here is. And clearly here I'm riffing on Paul Dorish's implications for design, no great surprise. But I wanted to think about if those are our kind of stakes in the ground, what are the implications for research? What would a research agenda and a research direction and objects of study and even the possible questions and theoretical tools we might use look like if we imagine that we're in a world that is undergoing both rapid transformation and some remarkable forms of stasis? So what does it start to look like? And I thought what I'd do here was spell out kind of six areas where I think it might be fruitful to go ask more questions. Areas where I know human beings are deeply engaged, where I know there is a strong role for technology, where I know there are different kinds of things happening around the world one might want to interrogate, and because, frankly, these are the things we're all told we're not supposed to talk about. And because I know, much like me who operates with lawyers who vet my foils before I show them, and who get deeply concerned about the kind of things you're about to see, I know many of you operate with human subjects protocol boards inside your universities. So the challenge is, how do we study these things that are deeply important to human beings inside that framework? Again, no foils were, were photoshopped. I found this sign outside a church in one of my hometowns in Australia. It got me thinking again about the notion of religion. I know many of you have heard me talk about this before. I know there are people in this room who work on religion. Religion continues to be one of the single most important things in people's lives. 80% of people on this planet are religious into one doctrine or another. All of those doctrines and institutions have powerful connections to technology. Some of those institutions drove the technologies that we now use. Many of those institutions also now embrace new technology and use them for all kinds of interesting things. Whether it is the Vatican's website, controversial currently, but it does have a lovely button on it called The Secret Archive. Why you would have a button on your website entitled The Secret Archive is news to me, but there it is. You can text the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. You can make most of your devotions for most Indian festivals online. People are engaging in all manner of things. There was a lovely call that went up, as it always does in Lent from Rome, to give up text messaging for Lent, or failing that just for Good Friday if Lent was too big a call. There's been an amazing debate going on in New York about what the relationship is between iPhones and the Sabbath. And if you have many of your automated services set up on your iPhone, does that mean you can or can't use it during the Sabbath? These are the kind of questions that have gone on for decades about what can and can't be used in the Sabbath, and that this is just part of that set of panoply of questions, no great surprise. We also know that people are involving technology in their daily spiritual practices too, not just their religious ones whether it's about using mobile phones to orient yourself to Mecca, whether it's about participating in belief.net, which is one of the largest social networking sites still in the world that has a religious bent and a lovely questionnaire. Tom, you should take this one too because I crash it every time I take it, which is to work out what religion you should be. 
Most of my friends up, is end up as Lutherans. I end up with a, could you come back later and try this again? So we know religion, a big sphere, and I know there are people who are already working on that, so I don't want to belabor that one. Government is another fascinating place. Of course, this would be the Australian government, you'd have to know. Um, politics, if we imagine, you know, religion, one of the things we're not supposed to talk about at dinner, dinner parties, politics would be the second. Uh, it turns out many of us work in spaces where governments will have interests. How we choose to align to those interests, how we choose to engage with them, critically important. I spent the last 18 months working with federal and state governments in Australia, helping them think about what the barriers to adoption might be and the drivers for new technologies. Over the last two years, the government in Australia has also run a task force to think about what it might be for government to take on Web 2.0 things. As you can imagine, for government, this was a fascinating conversation. When I first started working with the government, I said I wanted to run a blog so I could solicit citizens' input to the project I was working on. And they said, well, we can't have a blog. Why not? Well, we're government. OK. What's the problem? Well, if we have a blog and people tell us things we don't want to hear, what will we do? <laughs> like, well, we'll work out how to answer them. And then someone else suggested they should have a Facebook page, and then it all just went to hell. Because then it became a, but what if we don't have any friends? <laughs> exactly. And you're like, what will happen if people unfriend us? I'm like, OK, can we just get the page up first? And then we'll worry about whether you have friends or not. We got the page up and running, and then there were all these questions about how quickly did you need to respond to things? Well, it takes us four weeks. Like, that's not going to be good enough. But we have to vet the answer. We could work out how to do it in 24 hours. No, we couldn't. So some interesting challenges about internet time and government time and how those things map. But in the process of all this, the Australian government in this task force put out a call to all developers in Australia and said, listen, we have some big data sets. You know, one of the most popular websites on Australian government pages is actually Find Me the Public Restroom. It's one of the few things there is a downloaded app for. It's actually a, a very useful website. If you need a loo, there is a site that will tell you this. And it's comprehensively documented for all of Australia. Government has other sites that document similar kinds of things. Turns out, where are the public barbecues? Equally important. So we've got it all covered, both ends. Excellent. <laughs> so the government said, we have a lot of data sets. Why don't you work out what you could do with them? And two wonderful people from, uh, God, Lonely Planet in Australia decided that what they should do was take the data sets of roads, toilets, and barbecues, and basically say what citizens should be able to do is report when they were broken. So you should be able to put a tag on it, describe the problem, and then anything you were willing to do to mitigate the problem. And they came up with a site called It's Bug It Mate. What's wonderful about this is the Australian government loves this so much they are working out how to make it real. And there will be a site that hangs off of the Australian government called It's Bug It. Which suggests to me my government is so much cooler than all of yours. <laughs> but it also suggests to me what starts to happen as governments become willing to think about the data they have, to think about new forms of technology, and what it is that we can do as people who know how to think about those intersections to help them. And what the obligation is to engage with government, to participate, to act as effectively trusted advisors, is really interesting, as well as all the other questions one might want to think about about what the government role is in things like censorship, uh, regulation, uh, what kinds of places new technologies will be made apparent and made public and made available and what aren't, and how we start to have a more critical conversation about government in particular as an important stakeholder in how all this work gets done beyond the fields of education and health into a whole series of other spaces. So if you've got religion and politics, you know what's next. That's right. <laughs> Sex. So in the 1970s, when Polaroid cameras became really big in Britain, in the aristocracy, she says, wandering close to Tom Rodden as I say this, in the British aristocracy in the 1970s, when Polaroids were invented, there was a game they play called Guess the Bits. And as you're not laughing, I feel the need to explain to you what this was about. <laughs> There was a bowl at the door when you arrived. You put the Polaroid of your bits in there. They were pulled out later, and people had to guess who they belonged to. <laughs> Turns out people were sex texting long before they had mobile phones. They were, in fact, doing this with Polaroid cameras. And there is an argument that says, as long as there have been ways of documenting things, one of the things we have insisted on documenting is our bits and bobs. And then sharing them with others. Clearly, the space of sex is a really loaded one. <laughs> 
in all sorts of ways. This is a complicated place to do research. Those of us who try know that the organizations in our universities get very antsy when we say, we'd like to go study sex toys. Really? <laughs> yes. Or we'd like to go study changing sexual practices. Or we'd like to think about what it means to talk about the relationship between sex and technology. And talk about it beyond simply talking about pornography. Though talking about pornography would be an interesting place to have a conversation, as there is remarkably little data inside the formal publications of HCI about this. We talk about it as though everyone knows about it. To my reckoning, there is one long-suffering professor of STS at the University of Texas who actually writes on this stuff, and who periodically one wants to throw his papers on the table and go, one man, one man pursuing a lone kind of occupation of talking about the relationship between sex, pornography, and technology innovation. And he has a fairly cogent argument where he can look at the last 100 years of technology and say, if it is a good vehicle for pornography, it will make mass market adoption. And there are some obvious things that failed. Palm pilots. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, you know, some of it's hard to argue with him. But it also raises some really interesting questions about what it would be to take a critical look at this space. What would it mean to take a critical look at either the production and consumption of pornography? I mean, my friends in the South Australian Police Department tell me that 10 years ago when they had their very first bust, they got 100 pictures. And they thought they had just gone to heaven and died. This was like the best thing ever. They had taken 100 pictures out of circulation. That's 10 years ago. The last bust, 800,000. And they thought he was a small-time guy. So what does it mean to imagine a proliferation of images that dramatic? What does that mean for people's notions about self? about romance, about relationships, about sexual practice? What are the implications of that for all sorts of other things? How does that then become part of what drives a certain sort of hysteria about government messaging? And how do we start to provide a critical lens and a form of critical analysis to run over that, rather than pretending it isn't happening? And if we were gonna talk about sex and religion and politics, we should also talk about sport because I can't think of anything else that gets up people's noses quite as quickly as their team losing. <laughs> when I started writing this paper, one of the things I went and did was I ran all of these key words through the ACM portal, with it, which was fascinating, let me tell you. And I had the most astonishing moment of discovering there is less written in Kai and Ubercomp about sport than there is about sex, religion, and politics, singularly all put together. Sport, big thing, it turns out, in the rest of the world. Increasingly, I imagine, perhaps not in this room. And one wonders if we had more critical self-reflexivity as a theoretical position in this room, we might be able to articulate why it is that we don't want to talk about sport or study it. <laughs> I have a theory. <laughs> I'm not going to share it, but I'm sure you can guess it in the big speech bubble above my head. We were all beaten up by the boys who played sport in school and we don't want to study them now. <laughs> Turns out we might need to get over that. In 1880, a long-suffering Englishman, why does it always come down to that? A long-suffering Englishman came to Australia and he looked across Australia and he said, not to talk about cricket and not to understand cricket is a social crime. <laughs> Turns out, I took some Americans to Australia a year ago and they discovered that exactly the same thing is true. If they went, how can you possibly follow cricket? It takes five days. People thumped them and refused to buy them beer. So it, which is a much bigger problem. It's a big penalty. No one buys you beer. It's a bad moment. Sport, it turns out, big thing. It's a huge money maker. It is a huge driver of new technology adoption. 40% of Americans, when asked why they upgraded to HD in this country, gave the answer that sport looked better on it. Might not have been you in this room, but that's 40% of households that have upgraded their televisions. We know sport has been a driver of television upgrades around the world at various points in time. It has driven new forms of technology production in video capture, in being able to deal with multiple streams of content. For reasons that really elude me, it has to be said, it's also now one of the driving places of 3D. Who knew you needed to see golf in 3D? Who knew that made it better? It doesn't. I recently managed to wangle my way into a Burberry uh, 3D fashion show. They broadcast their fashion catwalk 
in 3D to five sites around the world. One could make scurrilous jokes about the fact that models don't actually get into 3D in 3D. <laughs> and God love them, they didn't, but still. It is the case that sport, hugely consuming. If you look at the amount of time spent online, either through fantasy sports or pursuing sports, if you look at the amount of time of anyone's television viewing in any high sports cycle, I can guarantee you this is something people are doing. Yet there are less than 40 papers written over the last 20 years in HCI and Ubercomp about sport. And most of them are written about things that aren't really sport. They're written about roller coasters, we say thank you to the English. They're written about going round and round and round in motocross in Scandinavia. There's one written about going to stadium games, and that's it. There's some lovely Canadians, again, love the Canadians, writing about augmenting hockey games, but they're not in our community. They're writing about actually how you put sensors on pucks. Turns out it doesn't work well. Those of you who've seen hockey might understand why. <laughs> and that's it. But here is this critical domain of human activity that schedules time and space, and we're not writing about it. So go forth. Manners and etiquette. I love this sign. The sign was in a lobby of a church in Korea. It loosely translates to, it would be a blessing if you turned your cell phone off. It speaks to a whole other space that we could also profitably study about people's changing relationships to where technology can and can't be used, and about the emergence of a kind of etiquette around technology. We recently did a study and discovered that while 80% of Americans believed you shouldn't use phones in churches, 70% of them thought it was probably okay to use them in bathrooms. Well, there's just a hygiene issue here that staggers me. That's okay. There are changing notions about where we imagine technology should be used, and by whom, and under what circumstances. And there are a whole lot of really interesting ideas that raises about what spaces are seen as being technologically kind of blank or technologically inviting and how we might start to think about how people are talking about and managing those. It's also the case that this sign for me points to some other things we've been seeing in the work we've been doing about people's changing relationships to being always connected and always on. And I think you can spell out an interesting tension here between the idea of devices that demand and function better under the circumstances of constant connectivity and people who don't. And people who actually need a little bit of downtime. And as we've been tracking across our work, one of the things we've seen is a series of choices people have made about vacation time, as in I will go somewhere where there is no connectivity. I will go somewhere that is a dead, dead zone, that has no mobile connectivity, that has no broadband, and it's become about making effectively a place where you can't get connected. So we may not yet have worked out what the right agency is for ourselves to turn things off, but we will go somewhere that forces us to be disconnected. And starting to think through what that means for all of us and our practice is really interesting. As is the fact that linguistically we don't have the language to talk about it. The only way we know how to talk about people who aren't connected is by talking about what they're not doing. They're not connecting. They're unconnected, they're disconnected, they're on the wrong side of the digital divide. All of that language supposes something about connectivity and imposes a notion of a morality here that says connectivity is good, everything else is bad. And interestingly, the people who study most technology behavior have not yet actually started to think about what you do with that collection of people. In the US, this is somewhere between 20 to 30% of citizens who aren't online or who aren't online regularly. And when you start to survey those groups of people and what little work there has been done, the answers are really tantalizing. Because when the answers are things like, there was nothing in it for me, to explain why you have come online and left again. I have to ask the question, what else is going on there? When disconnecting from the internet is not about money, but about there being nothing there that speaks to you, there is a whole set of second and third and fourth order research questions one might want to ask. And then last but not least, there is gender. I know there is a paper in this conference about feminism and HCI. There's a forthcoming journal being edited by Elizabeth Churchill and Charles and Bazell. I think this is probably timely. When I was thinking about what it would mean to talk about gender in HCI and what it would mean to impose a feminist critique on HCI, I thought, what might it be to just go take one of the places that's in the press all the time, the app store, and go look at what apps there were explicitly for men and for women? And my first port of call was to just go onto Google and type in best apps for men, and Google helpfully filled it out, best apps for mental health. And I didn't know what to make of that. 
Um, so I backtracked and I found best apps for men. And you know, there were lots of lists and I went through them. I looked at the most popular ones. And it turns out one of the most popular apps for men, and James Scott, wherever you are, this made me think of you, was something called PMS Buddy. You can track up to five women simultaneously on this. <laughs> which is not why it makes me think of James, just FYI. Um, and it has a dial on it, like a car, like a thermometer that basically says, these are the times to avoid these women. Good times, very bad, go away. Called PMS Buddy, it has lovely language wrapped around it about how you can track your girls. All kinds of things there, I'm just not even gonna go there. The I apps for women in this exact same space are entitled things like, for Aunt Flo, or I period, which I particularly like, <laughs> which offer a helpful calendar, and which offer days that you should blank out, and then days that have things like daisies, heels, and love hearts on them. And I thought to myself, okay, right there, you can put these two things side by side and say, you might not actually need a feminist analysis to say that gender is at work here, and that there are profoundly different ideas at play about the same phenomena for different audiences. And thinking about how I might continue to move that lens onto other things. This was, this was a back of an envelope analysis. What you could do if you were serious would be fascinating. And clearly, there's a lot of room to do it. And a lot of space to say, what might it mean to take something like the App Store, any number of other things, and say, how would we read this through a feminist lens, through a Marxist lens, through a post-colonial lens, through a queer theory lens, through a critical theory lens, and where would we land up? And what might it mean to talk about these things as objects of study? And what might it mean to think about how those things are then articulated to a broader community are all, for me, critical questions. So where does that leave us all? I have this sign here to remind myself that if we are willing to commit to a notion of the future that's a little more unstable than the present that we have lived in, and if we're willing to acknowledge the fact that the communities that we will study, the places where the technologies we produce will be consumed, look very different over the next 10 years than they look over the previous 10, we have to be willing to let go of some control here about what it's all gonna be like. We have to acknowledge that there are different voices that you're gonna need inside the tent, that there are different theoretical tools, I think we probably have to think some of our research agendas are gonna make people a little uncomfortable. I suspect it means we're all gonna to need to collectively strategize about how we handle our lawyers and our human subjects protocol committees and how we think about writing research projects that we can get our universities and granting authorities to buy off on. But there are enough senior people in the room that some of us sit on those committees, so we have to be willing to start asking different questions about the proposals we're seeing and different questions about what motivates them what the theoretical tools are that underpin them, and what the work's gonna be done when it's finished. I think it also means imagining we have to talk to a different set of communities and a different set of players and practitioners. And I suspect it also means we have to, where Beth started this conference, think about what our obligations are here. I think it's critically important to think about what it means to be someone who has the tools to make an analysis about new technologies about the relationship between technologies and human practice, about the relationship between technologies, human practice, government, governance, and all of those things. And I think all of us have various tools that in some ways obligate us to be the critical voices about these things as we move forward. It's not just gonna be enough to produce them, we have to be willing to think about what it means to talk about them critically too. And I think that's where I wanted to end it, with the charge to all of you that we're in this incredibly exciting moment where there's a lot of amazing stuff happening, both technically, socially, culturally, in terms of infrastructures and possibilities, and that if we're not working out how to embrace all of that, both as users ourselves, but also as practitioners, I think it's an incredible waste. And I think there is this amazing moment that we all sit in. And this is a great conference to have those conversations, to start to think about what it means to pull all that stuff apart and ask the hard questions and do the hard work and come up with the next set of really interesting research problems and research questions and research possibilities. And so with that, I wanna say thank you. <laughs>